And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to track two. We have our next talk coming up. Uh, I have just a few announcements to make. I really would like to thank the sponsors a lot, uh, MongoDB, uh, Microsoft, Verizon, Salesforce, uh, AWS, Information Security, uh, eLearn Security, Intel, uh, and Remediant as well. Thank you so much, sponsors, for making this event possible and for investing uh, and gathering us around and sharing uh, great content such as the one that we're gonna have today. Uh, remember also Career Village is doing resume reviews and mock interviews as well. So if you're interested in that, you should stop uh, stopping over on the sessions area, just here uh, on the on hop in. Uh, and that's, that's it. I am not gonna delay any more the presentation of Su Sushi and Liz Wharton. They're gonna talk about uh, unmasking the Avengers, shifting roles of Facial recognition. Uh, this is a live talk, uh, but it's going to be recorded, uh, and it will it, it will be available later. Uh, I think Liz just went off for a sec. Uh oh, I guess we had a quick technical difficulty. Quick, quick, quick technical issue. Oh no. Liz, do you need any help? She froze up and then fell down. No. All right. How about Marina? Let me let you work with Liz to try to get back, try to get her back online, and then I'll just walk through our intros. And hopefully, you guys will be back in a second. Okie dokie. Um. That's pretty much it. Just letting you all know uh, this live talk is going to be recorded. It's going to be available later. Uh, Q and answers, um, question and answers are going to be at the end of the talk. So if you have any questions, please just drop them on the stage chat and I'll be collecting them. And after the talk, I'll be the one uh, giving the questions to the speakers. And I'll be also posting the survey link. Uh, of this talk at the stage chat. So just be sure uh, to give them feedback uh, as, as soon as you can. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna try to rescue Liz and all right, be right back. All right. Hi guys, uh, my name is Suchi Pahi. I am a data privacy and cybersecurity lawyer with um, Rally Health, which is a wellness and tech platform. Uh, Liz and I have been working together for a little over a year now on facial recognition and algorithmic bias, and it's been an, an incredible space to be in because we've had the opportunity to um, iterate on our talks. So we initially started with ShmooCon earlier, and then as facial recognition kept rolling, and, and by that I mean the news and the research and, and things just kind of kept going and going, we've had the opportunity to pull out different pieces of our original like overview of facial recognition and really get more into the weeds with the surveillance side and what's going on with COVID-19 and all of that. So we're both really excited to be here today. And I know Liz has been having a little bit of a, a technical issue with the platform. So kicking us off. Um, and before we get that started, let me pull up our slide deck and we'll get going. So one of the things that we want to acknowledge and continue to acknowledge is that we have a huge social movement going on right now that is absolutely critical, both to cybersecurity and then the US generally. And so Black Lives Matter. And we've kept this at the forefront of our presentations because we want you to know that there are resources that you can access um, if you want to be an ally to the movement. and. Uh, when we make the slides available later, you'll be able to hit the notes section and there are like organizations that you can donate to, um, lists of articles that have recommendation for anti-racism books or how to have conversations about race. And, and we just want to encourage people in the community to be um, as, I think, integrated as you can with your fellow Black Americans and try to 
bring them up with you. And there are ways to do that. And since there are experts in the field who've done the research and, and laid it out all for you, um, we want to make that accessible to you. So today we're talking about unmasking the Avengers, shifting roles of facial recognition. Liz is the chief of staff at Scythe, um, an information security company that's based here out of DC. And they are entirely branded by unicorns, which is kind of the fun part. So um, if you've seen like the unicorn coloring books and the stickers and stuff like that, it's uh, Scythe and Grimm who are co-branded with this awesome stuff. We are lawyers. We are probably unicorns, but we're not your lawyers and we're definitely not your unicorns. So while we do practice law, none of this uh, presentation is meant to be taken as legal advice for you. We don't represent you in any way um, and, and we can't represent you. And I think with that, before we get started, let me see if Liz is back. Okay. All right. So while we wait for Liz to hop back in, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started on this, but hopefully as soon as she's back, she can take over from here. So level setting, the current state of affairs. First things that we saw with um, facial recognition were your uncovered faces. So if you came back in from a trip, um, Custom Border Patrol probably had you stand in front of like a passport kiosk and you had to give them a bunch of documents and then they took a picture of your face and it's all serviced by probably some contractor and we don't really know much about the security and data privacy and who has access. Um, we can probably assume that it's Homeland Security and then for cause and all of that stuff. But all that to say is there's a picture of your face and every time you go in and out of the US, um, you get repeat pictures. So I'm assuming over like a period of five years, if you're a frequent traveler, then over five years, DHS will see how you've changed. Um, the picture in the middle is sort of like a stylized version of what a face print would look like. And you can see that it's taking certain data points instead of just like a regular picture. And basically what we've seen it used for is very casual things. Um, open your phone, open your computer, your passport. And that's pretty much it. So let's go back to face points. Defining an image, face print. So the face print is defined as data points that are compromised, uh, comprised of various measurements of a person's face geometry, like the distance between your eyes, nose, and ears, and compiled into a string that can be stored and recognized. It's a very specific definition. And the reason that it's that specific is because we want to be able to pinpoint the difference between when someone is just taking a picture versus when someone is taking these types of data points for use later. And so we have facial recognition and everything that goes with it. And then we have facial authentication. And what we really want to distinguish here is where is the control and where is the consent? So if I'm personally saying yes to you using my picture to access a phone or to access my computer or otherwise access my data, um, I have chosen to do that. But then there's the other piece of it, which is if I'm just existing out in the world and you're taking face prints of my face as I go about my daily business, do I have any control over when it's captured and what you're doing with it next? And that's what brings us into the, uh, what are commercial uses of face prints looking like and what are government uses of face prints looking like. Just this uh, August or July, the GAO reported uh, published a report about facial rec recognition technology vendors, and we've linked to it in our sources. It's a really great overview of where facial recognition technology is now in commercial uses or private uses in the US. And so what they've noted is that from 2016 to 2019, the global facial recognition technology market generated three to five billion dollars in revenue. Which really leads you to think if you haven't come across facial recognition in your daily life already, you probably just aren't aware of it um, being used, but it is being used because it seems very ubiquitous. 
what the GAO also predicted is that from 2022 to 2024, the revenue is expected to go from $7 billion to $10 billion. Uh, the GAO report pulled out a list of all of the patents that have been granted that are associated with facial recognition. And as you can see, it's gone up and up and up every year. Now, while we were at ShmooCon and SummerCon, we had shown uh, patent applications and over time there was a dip in 2018. But it turns out when you just pull out the ones that have actually been granted, you see just a constant uptick in different facial recognition related patents. And one of the things that the GAO made sure to sort of pull out in their report was that even if the application, um, like even if the patent was actually granted, it didn't necessarily mean that the company that applied for it was actually building anything that was describing the patent. And this is um, typically what we describe as like making a war chest. Uh, Exxon used to be really known for this, in which case they would just file a bunch of patents and that was their way of just protecting potential IP that they perhaps never really meant to use but could use in litigation later. So there's a good chance that that is also what's going on here. But in Liz, what was really significant is that facial recognition isn't going anywhere. And that's why you guys might see uh, from mine and Liz's Twitter or from any of the researchers who are working in the space that there's a repeated call for making sure that you can try to regulate or protect uh, consumer privacy or enact some security from this burgeoning facial recognition technology. Okay, which brings us to the next part, law enforcement Twitter. Sorry, law enforcement uptake of facial recognition. I'm hoping we get Liz back soon because she has been a partner of mine in this for a long time, so I don't want to just do the whole thing by myself. <laughs> Um, the law enforcement uptake of facial recognition is something that is getting into the public awareness more and more now. And what we wanted to do was focus in on the Amazon Ring experience. And here we have a graphic. This is from, I think, July of this year, July or August of this year. Um, it's Ring partnerships with various different PDs. And you can see from the icons that we've used here, like it's pretty widespread even just in this small area. And Amazon Ring has had a lot of different um, press come about how Ring is you know, not really that great or it sets its bar too low for its surveillance or it backs up to X, Y, Z. And so there are a lot of questions about how the PDs are using their Ring partnerships. Similarly, now you have the Ring Neighbors Public Safety Service service, which is like an interaction between the PD and people who've opted in to allowing the PD to access their surveillance from their rings. And one of the interesting things is that um, Callie Schroeder, who's based out of Colorado and with Verisafe, she had once tweeted that, you know, she really just wanted a really bright light or some kind of laser because every time she was going on her walk down her street, she'd have a lot of uh, she'd see these ring cameras set up at people's houses because they want to do like home protection and stuff. But to her, it felt like an invasion of privacy that anyone could, any PD could just be like, hey, a uh, person, will you let me see your um, surveillance video? And if that neighbor said yes, then you could just slowly have a PD collecting a bunch of information about one person over time, taking their dog on a walk or whatever. So it's kind of a question of, what have you consented to having surveilled about you by just being in X space? Like it used to be a public and a private difference, but now it feels like even some things that felt like they were yours and you could remain anonymous to an extent are very much identifiable and trackable. Here we have a graphic that's the status of reported partnerships, photo searches between states and the FBI, uh, facial analysis, comparison and evaluation services. So you can see that there are some states that are operating off of just driver's license and ID cards. Uh, there are states that are still negotiating with the FBI. And then there are states where facial recognition is entirely prohibited. And you'll note that there aren't that many of them here. Um, I think it's extremely interesting that 
Nebraska and North Dakota and Utah, which you wouldn't think of as the most highly populated states, are very on board with these imaging and facial recognition searches um, in their states. All right, so then came the takers. All of a sudden, people have started posting pictures of themselves with masks, which makes sense because we're now in COVID-19 and if you're responsible, you're wearing masks to protect yourself and protect other people. Um, what that means though, is that you're also providing a lot of data for people to grab and use to help adjust their algorithms, uh, especially with like the COVID-19 selfies like this one. So post your mask selfie for support. This one was all over Twitter. I believe it was also all over Facebook and cross posted to Instagram. So all of a sudden, like you have data sets where it's square, good lighting, and there's a mask covering someone's face and you can just pull those and start going through those to see if your algorithm actually works on one-to-one -one matching or one-to-many matching. And the question is, if you're looking at facial recognition and you're training these algorithms on data sets, who actually is holding the data set standards? And so most recently, uh, around May, there was an article about how well can algorithms recognize your face? Initially, there were claims at that point in time that there were companies who could, even with 70% of your face covered with a mask, could figure out who you were from a crowd, which is like one to many matching. And as Anil Jain states in this article, and we've pulled out the quote for you guys, companies can quote internal numbers, but we don't have a trusted database or evaluation to check that yet. There's no third party evaluation. Now, the interesting part of or there's no third party validation. And the interesting part of that is that a lot of people are trying to position NIST as the standard setter and potentially use for regulation of facial recognition by saying, okay, NIST, uh, you should tell us that there's a certain type of data set, um, number involved in the data set or standard that algorithms should be trained to or should be using. And NIST is actually set up as an advisory body, so they're really not interested in taking up that type of a role. Um, and this is despite the fact that NIST is involved in setting up security frameworks and privacy frameworks that you guys are probably accustomed to um, seeing in the space, but they're, they're really not interested in taking that up in any other capacity, which is why the GAO has specifically called that out in the report that they released this year. Um, so we're still looking at the fact that there's no real third party validation. Interestingly, despite the fact that in May there were people saying that, hey, our algorithms can definitely tell who you are with full confidence when you have a mask on because we focus on the area around the eyes, what um, NIST found in their most recent report was when they tested the algorithms that were available and had been submitted to NIST before COVID-19, they found that the masks still increased for all of them, the false non-match rates for one-to-one -one testing. So for example, if you're coming from Mexico to Texas and you're coming through the border control, um, if you were wearing a mask and facial recognition was being used, it was more likely to say that a match wasn't there than actually appropriately predict the match. And this is true for all of the algorithms that they had submitted. So while there is a lot of um advertising and marketing in the facial recognition space saying that hey yeah we can totally see who you are what you're doing when you have a mask uh it looks like nist hasn't been able to show that that's true and i'm not entirely sure if nist is going to run another study that shows whether um like companies that focus more on east asian populations where mask use is ubiquitous uh can better and so I'm not sure if a study like that is, is going to happen or whether those companies are going to submit their algorithms. All right, all of that aside, is it legal? So ICE just signed a contract with Clearview AI. And if you haven't heard about Clearview AI, you may be living under a rock or not based in the US. I mean, there is that too. So uh, the Clearview AI contract that ICE just signed is $224,000. And it's it's very vague. Um, it I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why I signed it. I have a hundred different guesses. I think because Clearview had said that it would 
stop selling its app to private companies and would avoid transacting with non-governmental customers anywhere. So I guess this is in line with what they've decided to do. Um, but Clearview AI is controversial because its founder has associations with white supremacy, um, white supremacist ideology, and on top of that, it's facing a number of lawsuits and investigations, both here in the US and across the world. So um, Clearview AI is very weirdly being used by government agencies across the US. Um, for example, here we have, well, I guess this is Canada. Here we have a detective constable in the sex crimes unit for Canadian law enforcement who says it's the best thing that's happened to victim identification in the last 10 years because they've made eight IDs of either victims or offenders through the new tool. And then also there's Chica the Chicago PD, which is using um, the tool to actually look through unknown suspects to see if it matches a database of uh, pictures that have been lifted from Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, which is interesting because the problem that Clearview is running into is that they grabbed a bunch of pictures that they really shouldn't have grabbed. And it's unclear what standards they're using to um, actually match the photos. So back to those lawsuits. Google, Microsoft, and Facebook have sent cease and desist letters telling Clearview to stop scraping images from their platforms and services. And then you have the UK ICO, which is actually looking into Clearview, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, which is looking into Clearview. And also, we saw news this morning that was posted, so I guess now like 30 something hours ago, that German regulators are also looking into Clearview and asking about their data practices. On top of that, there are four class action lawsuits going on against this company in Illinois, California, and New York. All right, pending legislation. This is pulled from epic.org state policy and facial recognition website. I actually highly recommend that if uh, their website and their coverage of facial recognition, if you're interested in this topic. And also at the end of this slide deck, we have a set of resources that um, you can access if you're interested. And there are people who are very well known in the space uh, on the technical side and also on the legal side that you can reach out to for more information, or if you're interested in getting involved in how to stop the spread of facial recognition or assist with like fixing algorithmic bias. Um, all that aside, so these are the pending bills that are coming up in Maryland. There is a Facial Recognition Privacy Protection Act, um, and that hearing was canceled. There was a task force to study law enforcement surveillance technologies. Um, there are required disclosures, and you can see just that there are attempts being made to address this at a state by state level. And for some of you who are listening, you know, maybe you're wondering why state by state, why not federal? And this brings us to sort of the larger problem that we have in the United States is that we're not really embracing what we call federal privacy legislation. And there's a big question mark around whether federal privacy reg uh, legislation would actually cover facial recognition or biometric privacy, which actually brings us back to the GAO report again. Uh, fascinatingly, the GAO report makes the difference between facial recognition and facial analysis. So it seems like you can infer that there's a claim that if a company is engaging in what they call facial analysis, they're not necessarily engaging in facial recognition, so maybe facial recognition laws wouldn't even apply. If you're curious about what your state is potentially doing to address facial recognition, um, I would check out epic.org and see what your state is doing. As you can see from the white space that is Texas, it doesn't look like Texas is doing much in that area. All right. What I didn't touch on yet is that a lot of the problems that people have with facial recognition algorithms is that sometimes the algorithms aren't accurate. Um, an example of that is that Al Amazon had released a uh, algorithm that was being used for facial recognition, and it was tested by a nonprofit group on co Black Congress members. And what it did was it identified Black Congress members, I think almost all of them, as matching potential Black criminal suspects. And so a lot of the problems that you'll read about are like, hey, what about 
um, the fact that the algorithm mismatches people? And what about the fact that the algorithm is biased? And that's an important set of questions. And then there's the second important set of questions, which was raised to Liz and I at ShmooCon, which is, what if the algorithms are fine? What if they're super accurate? What if there isn't bias involved? Then do we still have a problem with facial recognition? And honestly, the answer is yes, because we still have ethical considerations about what we think about privacy, what we think about using facial recognition in a variety of different contexts. One of the most important things in the US used to be uh, anonymity, because you should be able to express your opinions about really important things without people having to straight to you. And this has been protected by the courts from pretty early on in history. And I'm, I'm losing the quotation off the top of my head, but it, there's a great case about the need for anonymity. And I think it was related to uh, a column that was in a newspaper disagreeing with someone's opinion. Um, anyway, we are big fans of anonymity. All of our heroes are masked. You can see Spider-Man, Black Panther, Captain America. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I know Captain America, America later, but anyway. anyway. issues. Um, I don't know where I cut out. So hopefully it was around terror capitalism, which is a really great phrase about uh, how Uyghurs are being treated in China. And basically, this is where facial recognition is being uh, used in, in some of the worst ways. And so there's a small company in China, and I say small 
it seems pretty relative. I think I'd consider it mid-size in the U.S. And what the company is doing is it's advertising that it can group up to 70% um, with 70% effectiveness a group of people as uh, Uyghurs, which is a ethnic minority in China. And that way, the Chinese state can pick up the Uyghurs and uh, deport them to basically concentration camps or um, have forcible sterilization or re-education um, or state-mandated uh, abortions, which is the current status of Uyghurs. And if you're curious more about what the Uyghurs are going through or what's being uh, inflicted on them, the spelling is U-I-G-H-U-R-S. Sometimes you'll it depends on who wrote the article. I think the Brits sometimes use UY. Um, all that to say, terror capitalism is not just a China thing, though. It is also something that's being used outside of China by different, more autocratic states uh, and dictatorships to try to identify people who don't agree with whatever the party lines are. And I think without some type of emphasis on ethics and engineers from the ground up building things, knowing how they can be abused, we'll see more and more of this. And sort of partnered with that is the 30,000 unsuspecting Roseville attendees who are scooped up in a facial recognition test. So sports stadiums pre-COVID-19 were jumping on this uh, bandwagon because what they wanted to do was make sure people could still uh, attend these events without worrying about um, like lone shooters or they wanted to pick up people who had um, perhaps jumped the gates, things like that. And so what they would do is they'd surveil these huge crowds and that means that they were getting a lot of people's faces when they were coming in through the gates and building data sets. And so the question is here, how many people knew of it? In this case, the people who went to the Rose Bowl didn't know about it. And the other question is, what happens with that data set later? And does that data set actually have an effective algorithm that's being used on it? Or is it just pulling people um, based on like a 30% accuracy, which, which isn't a lot, but could be a threshold that it's set up. And even assuming it's all very accurate and working very well, which is the whole point of this section, do we really want to encourage that kind of mass surveillance? What if data brokers take that data set and tie it to other data and sell it to a giant marketing firm later? You know, these are the questions that we still have that are really unanswered. Hey, Suchi. <laughs> so, hi. Yeah. Well, Back. I'm Thank glad you. you could join us to talk You're about- You're doing such a great job, but <laughs> it's also fascinating to see how the, you know, when you talk about the mass surveillance, how that's also getting swept up in the university uh, and the contact tracing and some of those other, the multi-uses, and especially when you talk about Clearview AI and how they've pulled their data set, not from- necessarily the law enforcement or the typical, but they've scraped this information from other places. So, so what have IBM, Amazon, and Microsoft yeah. been up to? I hear they've had a, a boring summer. <laughs> That's what we like to call it. And you know, I think my favorite thing was when you marked up Microsoft's alleged ban of facial recognition sales. So walk us through it, <laughs> Well, Liz. of course, because they, you know, you see these platitudes that come out and says, we do not sell our facial recognition technology to U.S. police departments today until there is a strong national, you know, blah, 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 blah. So we hear that and you think, okay, so Microsoft doesn't, and I circled, sell their uh, technology to U.S. police departments and until, you know, and it goes through all this different stuff. And when you break that down, of course, because you're not actually selling it, uh, different companies are the ones selling it. You may not be selling it to law enforcement, but instead these other companies who are getting that data are the ones that are entering into partnerships. So next. Yeah, no, 
Yes, I was there. And so, for example, ring. Uh, and in this case, they said, okay, we're not going to do any new uh, partnerships. We're not going to do any new. Well, okay, but at the same time, you've entered into you know, 29 different, you know, they've already got these in place and they're already sharing that data existing. And again, it's not that they're getting, you know, entering into these contracts and agreements directly. It's the third party sharing. So then we get to heroes or red herrings. And Liz and I were both looking at this and all of these companies had AI ethics boards, but to our knowledge, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google really don't anymore. Um, and they're claiming that they're not going to do a number of things with facial recognition. IBM still has an ethics board or it's in partnership with an ethics group uh, in which they have some leadership. But what we found fascinating was there are some weird <laughs> partnerships that exist outside for tech innovation. And Liz, I don't know if you want to talk about yeah, this. No, it, well, and it gets into, well, okay, you're not doing this directly, but instead the companies have started creating these uh, foundations, nonprofits, or other uh, side businesses that are looking at this and identifying. And so again, it goes back to, well, who is the one creating, controlling, and scraping, and who is the one selling? And it again goes back to, oh, great, you're not doing this directly. And yeah, you're doing this great job putting it on hold, but oh, wait, it's because you've secretly uh, or behind the scenes created these foundations that are the ones instead doing it. Yeah. <laughs> And so one of the things is that there are a lot of names that we won't recognize um, because you don't see them in the news in the U.S., but they're actually used a lot in the U.S. And Liz, I think there was something you found specifically really interesting about the NEC. And that's what you yeah, out so here. with NEC, a Japanese company, and they have created their uh, their systems as you hear these companies like okay google amazon everyone else saying no well it's because it's the companies like nec that are actually doing it and in this case they have over a third at the time like from their own disclosures they are working with and in partnerships with over a third of the u.s state police and law enforcement agencies in addition this is also one of the companies that's doing a significant portion of the biometric facial recognition technology for airports around the world uh, and the airlines. And so keeping in mind when we say airports, we're talking about the airlines as well as you have to look at uh, the TSA and all those others, but it's one company that's ending up with a lot of these contracts. It's not just Clearview. And you, again, you'll notice these are not, it's a private company, not the law enforcement route directly collecting. So it gets it outside of some of the, in the U.S. constitutional protections when you, start, when you move it to that private company. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of want to know what's going on in Ohio. <laughs> Don't you, Liz? Like we've got all the colors on Ohio, federal facial recognition, CCH, and then of course DHS has some iris scanning, but it's a little odd, like a hodgepodge of what's going on in Ohio, guys. I right. have well, they <laughs> had to you had to move it out of Illinois because Illinois and BIPA class actions right. are going between Illinois, New York, and California. That's right, that's right. And actually, Liz, maybe it'll be helpful if you want to talk about the Biometric Privacy Act briefly. I think it's the only one we have right well, now. Well, right? California has a brought in their own, as well as some of the states like Maryland have tried to tie in the biometric uh, to their existing, but that's why you see with Illinois, all the class action lawsuits, for example, Macy's just had uh, a new one filed last month, 
a, a class action in Illinois that Macy's was using the facial recognition technology and not telling. So with Illinois, it's you have to tell people that you're using it, tell people that you're collecting it, tell them why and how long, provide those details. And Macy's wasn't doing that. So we're going to see how that one plays out as well. Yeah. Yep. It's going to be fascinating. And I was just telling our audience here that we really aren't expecting a federal privacy regulations and, and we're going to keep seeing these state by state moves. So, um, all right. So we got rid of IBM and Google and Microsoft and they all said, we don't want to be a part of this mm -hmm. allegedly. And who's left? Exactly. Well, it is the people who have actually been scraping and collecting. So Clearview gets uh, a lot of attention. Edemia is another one, as well as NEC. And do we have, uh, let's see, talking about, uh, but also talking about with the Clearview and where they've really stepped into the forefront of a lot of the lawsuits and um, a lot of the class actions where you have even private companies saying, hey, Clearview, stop doing this, stop doing this. Yet on the flip side, Clearview, and I know you talked about the recent um, uh, customs or ICE uh, contract. So you have all these different companies that are doing it outside of the government regulations in the sense of their private individuals scraping and they don't have the ethics boards. Right. And so this brings us to our takeaways. What is happening in the facial recognition space? Well, as, as you noted, uh, it, there's the lack of guidance. Uh, you know, the U.S. government's just trying to keep up with the GAO report saying, hey, there more needs to be done. Uh, NIST is trying to create the standards, uh, but again, with such a low bar and it, you know, there's just chaos. And with that, the challenge becomes to be to be vigilant. And as you know, in the technology field in information security and the companies that you're working for, the research that you're working on and holding the lawmakers as well accountable saying, hey, what is happening to my data? And are we building the algorithms and are we overseeing this in such a manner that it's helpful? And there's no walking it back, you know, with the genie is out of the bottle and it, there are benefits to the technology it's okay now, how do we con not contain it, but how do we frame it? How do we put in the training wheels that we need to keep it moving forward, but in a manner that respects our data and our privacy? Yeah, and if you wanna know more about what you can do from the engineering side, um, I know our ShmooCon talk focused pretty much on that, and have resources for engineers to associate with professional ethics organizations that were started by other engineers. Um, so definitely feel free to just grab that off of YouTube and, and use that. And what we'd also like to point you guys to before we come back to questions and complaints is we have a pretty extensive resources section. So you can click on some of these links and go explore the articles yourselves um, and the reports yourselves. Like I really recommend diving into this if you're interested. And there's a lot more to explore we have facial recognition and longitudinal data over time, um, creeping use cases for non-facial yeah. recognition biometric technology. And especially yeah. as law. we're all obviously virtual um, and some of the technology that's being used in, if you're interviewing and you're interviewing via, you know, camera, is the camera tracking the AR, VR, you know, with those headsets, how is that information being used and how you're kind of, again, reining it in and making sure that if this is the intended, but yes, a deeper dive there. And then also we'll share our slides and in the notes section of each of the slides, uh, we also tried to provide additional links so that you can find the information yourself. 
Yep. And Liz and I also work together to grab people that we would definitely uh, recommend following or reaching out to if you're still interested in facial recognition and biometrics. Um, all of these people are, are really at the forefront of their fields and incredibly helpful and, you know, neck deep in research. Yes. So I think, I think you guys said we missed the audio on this slide, perhaps. And Liz, I don't know if you want to go ahead and, and take it away. <laughs> well, it, really some of the issues that come up when we talk about the ring and next door and all of this, that the biometric data, the information, the facial recognition, understanding that and highlighting how flawed it is, what happens when you have a police department that puts out an alert and says, okay, here's who we're looking for and people get it wrong. And if, you know, the Twitter sluice come in and say, oh, I think it's this person. I think it's that person. You end up doxing the wrong people and the kind of the triple trickle down effect, but it goes to highlight and Suchi's also making fun of me by asking me to share about this slide in particular, because uh, when I walk my dog at night, I tend to notice the number of neighbors who have ring and I put, you know, give a little dance. I, I make sure that they are getting their money's worth out of that uh, surveillance state that they've created, that law enforcement are going back asking, and a lot of people don't know you could opt out, but where is that information being shared and what is the harm that comes from it, especially when you get it wrong? And I think that's it from us and we'll open up for Q&A. Hi there, I'm back. <laughs> All right, we are opening up for a Q&A then. Uh, if anyone in the chat has any questions, please let us know. Uh, all right, we have our first. What can non engineers do to help protect themselves? Uh, or rather, how can I educate my family members on safer practices regarding using social media to help avoid contributing to facial recognition data databases? That is a pretty big question. <laughs> uh, and keeping in mind, I mean, some of it, the your family members don't have, uh, it's kind of, if you use social media, it's being scraped. And if you're, you know, in, and even beyond that, and what we've tried to highlight is even just by having a driver's license, uh, you're getting scraped in as well, uh, that states and stuff have done that. To that end though, you know, educating and letting people know that, hey, this is, you know, this is how some of this is being used. This is be aware when you're doing that, but also saying question what, you know, push back, push back against the Macy's, the Asher uh, state uh, and local legislators, if the federal folks can't get it right, you know, you do have those avenues. Some of the cities, especially uh, California, you have different uh, municipalities breaking out and saying, hey, we're going to put some restrictions on how this is getting used. Have those conversations. Yeah, I think Echoing everything Liz said, and then also we have, um, you know, people with children should know that it's not the best idea to post pictures of your babies and your baby pictures as they go on, go through life, like online, because also maybe they don't want to have that information out there and you don't want it to be part of the FR databases, um, the data sets, and then write to your congressperson, which sounds like the lamest thing I could say, but it's also the most effective thing because if there's no federal privacy legislation for biometrics the most you can do or least you can do is say hey state uh i really want you to pass some legislation so people aren't creeping me out just when i'm using the internet and, the and i just tag suchi in all my pictures uh so that it really messes up some of the algorithms and especially my nieces and nephews <laughs> we've got another one uh we have just a few minutes more, so I guess this is going to be also our, our last one. 
what would be the potential repercussions to a firm storing facial biometrics if they were breached? Oh, hmm. Clearview AI. Uh, luckily, their most recent breach was only uh, doing it, but it's happened. And uh, keeping in mind, repercussions only work if you know, enforcing it, for example, when you have NEC and endemia, and uh, they're located outside the US. Uh, great. Okay. Uh, the US is you know, strenuously objecting and what else are you going to do? You know, how do you enforce when the companies are like, I mean, we're worldwide. All right. And those jobs for everybody, I guess. Thank you for your answers. Thank you for your talk. Thank you both for the content that you shared. Sorry, everyone, for the little glitch that we had. <laughs> It's okay. The good news is y'all have the better half for the whole talk. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Uh, thanks again for our sponsors. I would like to have uh, to give you a quick announcement. Uh, just remembering that, uh, reminding that the indie keynote is going to be delayed for thirty minutes today. And thank you all. Thank you. We're gonna jump off now. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye. Bye.